Amen. We're carrying on with uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. Amen. And, uh, you know, Keith uh, and Steve and myself have done a couple of sessions. And uh, we're going to carry on. So if we open up to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, and uh, we're going to uh, do the next line in the Lord's Prayer. Amen. And just as a recap, Jesus was teaching the disciples in, in the Gospel of Luke, the Lord, uh, the disciples came to the Lord and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And the Lord then answered and he said, after this manner, therefore pray ye. And so what the Lord Jesus was giving them was a pattern of prayer. He was giving them not a formula, but a way to enter into God's presence and pray. And so he said, after this manner, or in this form, or in this fashion, therefore pray ye. And then he said, firstly, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so the first thing we do in our prayer and in our walk is we give glory, we give honor to the Father. Amen. That's the first thing we do. And then the next step the Lord Jesus gave us was, uh, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And we see there, uh, along with worshiping God and giving glory and honor to God first and foremost, we see there the next thing is that we submit our lives to His kingdom. We submit our lives to His will and to His purposes. And so, not my will be done, Father, but your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then the next thing we see is the Lord uh, giving us verse 11. And He says, now we can pray, give us this day our daily bread. And so, first and foremost, even as we go through the, the, the rest of the chapter, we will see there that the Lord always says, seek the kingdom first. Seek his things first, and then, you know, God is going to add all these other things. But the next thing in verse 11, the Lord Jesus uh, says we should pray, is give us this day our daily bread. So firstly, after honoring and reverencing the Father, saying, your will, Father, be done on earth as it is in heaven, then he says we can look at our daily provision, our daily supply, and ask God for that. Now notice, if you will, I don't know what translation you've got, but in verse 11, it doesn't say uh, there, well, let's, let's say something like, uh, oh, Lord, if, if it be thy will today, cast us a little scrap, but only if your sovereign will desires it, Lord. You know, it doesn't say that, does it? It says there very boldly, the Lord Jesus said we can ask boldly, Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. And what was Jesus' expectation would happen when we asked him to ask Father to give us our daily bread? The Jesus' expectation was it, oh, maybe it'll work. You might just get an answer from heaven. You know, if you bang on the doors of, of uh, you know, heaven long enough, you might just get an answer. No. Jesus' expectation was that when we ask, we will receive, right? Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, Jesus said, when we ask, we will receive. When we seek, we will find. And when we knock, the door will be open to us. Amen. And, you know, even when we look back at, you know, great men of God uh, from the past, who knows George Mueller? You know, very well known in this area. But there was a man who understood, give us this day our daily bread. You know, when you read the testimonies of George Mueller, you see a guy who understood that God would answer his prayer to feed not only him, but his orphans. He understood that God would answer in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want us to look at three areas of receiving our daily bread. Because when it's talking about our daily bread, it's talking about our supply, our provision. You know, everything that we need for the day. 
Amen. And there's two things, or three things we can look at. Number one, our natural lives, right? God wants to look after our natural lives. Number two, and most importantly, our spiritual lives. You know, we need spiritual food, and God wants to give us spiritual food. Amen. And coffee. And the other thing that the Lord wants, or I believe the Lord wants us to look at a little bit today, is healing. Healing as the bread of God. Amen. Amen. So, firstly, our natural lives. How many of you know God wants you to have everything you need for day-to-day living? Amen. Verse 8, the Lord Jesus said, uh, he, he said, Your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. And now, many people won't ask God because they'll say, Well, God knows that I have need of these things, and so I'm not going to ask. But the Lord Jesus says, You need to ask. Even though God knows you need these things, you still have to ask Him. Amen. That's just the principle of how things work. But God wants our needs to be met. Now, when it comes to things, God wants us to have things, you know. God wants you to have your daily food. He wants you to be able to pay your rent and do all of these other things. But He doesn't want those things to have you. He doesn't want you to be pursuing those things and your life be consumed with chasing after all of these other earthly things. Does that make sense? You know, God will take care of that for you. He said, look to me, and I will take care of that. I will put you in the right position. I will get you the job. I will look after you. But, you know, don't let that be the thing that captivates your heart. Amen. And then he says there, and and I want to actually work through this. Verse 19. We don't chase off the stuff. We don't let our lives be controlled by things. Verse 19. The Lord Jesus talking there, he says, Lay up, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, and where thieves break in or break through and steal. But lay up for, for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust do corrupt, and where thieves do not break in or break through nor steal. And so God's saying, don't let the things of this earth possessions, your car, you know, your job, you know, all of these other things. Don't let that be the treasure of your heart. It's great if you've got it. It's fine. But don't let that be the thing that drives your life. Amen. He said, let heaven, let heaven, let the kingdom be the thing where your treasure is, where your heart, where your desire is, is for heaven and for the things of heaven. Lay up treasures in heaven. Amen. And he said, therefore, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And and verse 22 goes along with this. He says, the light of the body is the eye. He says, if therefore your eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. But if your eye, but if if thine eye be evil, then your whole body shall be shall be full of darkness. And that sometimes escapes us. What does it mean to have an evil eye? Evil eye? And what he's talking about here is the divided heart. Your heart is divided. So he says when your eye is single, when your focus is single in purpose, and you're looking unto the Lord, you will be full of the light of God. But when your heart is divided, when your eye is evil, right? Then you want to be, oh, I want to be in God's kingdom and everything. But at the same time, I want all of the things of the world as well. Your heart is divided. Amen. And so he said, when your eye is like that, when you see God's kingdom, but at the same time, you see the world. He said, your eyes are evil. And and he said then, he said, if, but if an eye be evil, a whole body is full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee, Be darkness. How great is that darkness? And he just said, somebody who lives like that, they think they're in the light. They think with one foot in in, in God's kingdom and one foot in the world, they're walking in the light. But he said, actually, you're in darkness. And he said, you're deceived. And he said, if you think that's light, he said, how great is that darkness that you're so deceived 
and, and because you think you're walking in light. Amen. But he said there, and this is the verse 24, and the, here's what his conclusion is. He said, no man can serve two masters. Amen. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon was the god of money or mon uh, finances, you know, the things of this world. And he is just saying there, you know, you, you, your heart, it does not work when it's divided. If your heart, you know, you think, oh, I want everything that God has, but I don't want to miss out. Maybe I'm missing out on something in the world. Amen? He says it doesn't work. It, it cannot work. A house divided cannot stand. And then he goes on and he says, Therefore, I say to you, take no thought of your life. And that no thought there, obviously I'm reading King James, but the more modern translations would say, do not worry. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, nor of your own body, what you shall put on. And he said, is not life more than meat or food? And is not the body more than just clothes? Amen? And so we have a wonderful Father in heaven. We have a great Father. You know, and a Father takes care of us. A Father takes care of His children. And He says, do not worry. Take no thought about these things. Verse 26, He goes on, He says, Behold, the fowls of the air, the birds of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And the King James says here, are you not much better than they? And uh, the, the New King James and other translations say, to God, you are so much more valuable than these sparrows or these birds. And if he looks after the birds, how much more is he not going to look after you, his children? Amen? Which of you, and this is, we're talking about worry, yeah? He said, which of you, by taking thought or worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? Well, stature, stature, one cubit to his stature. And so the Lord is saying, what has worry ever done for you? Eh? Has worry solved your problems? Right? But what has worry done for us? Right? Worry causes stress, causes anxiety. Worry causes depression. Worry destroys your immune system. Worry destroys your health. So Jesus said, don't worry about it. You know, do not worry. Do not worry. Amen? Let your eye be single. Amen. Amen. Verse 28. And why take ye thought for clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And then verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field which is today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more? Shall he not much more? You get that? Shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. We have a faithful God. Hallelujah. We have a wonderful Father in heaven. Therefore, take no thought. Do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we be clothed with? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. And so he said, don't be like the world, right? The world chases after all of that stuff, right? Thinking that that brings fulfillment, that that brings happiness, that that brings peace and joy and happiness, but it doesn't. He said, don't be like the world, don't chase after those things, right? Amen. For after these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. God knows we need these things. And God will provide. God will supply. Amen. And verse 33, which goes along with the Lord's Prayer. Seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God is saying to us, I'm a good father. I'm a faithful father. I'm not an absentee father. I'm not going to abandon you. And I will take care of you. Just look to me. Set your affection, set your heart on me. And I will take care of you. I will open doors for you for a good job. I will open doors for you for a good opportunity. I will bring favor to you. I will cause things to work on your behalf. All you do is keep your heart and your life and your mind and everything fixed on me. I will take care of you. I'm a good father. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so the next thing we can look at is our spiritual food. Give us this day our daily bread as spiritual food. This is the most important thing, is our spiritual food. Amen. I think out of that, all of the other things flow. As we've just said, we put God first. We put His Word first. God wants us to feast daily on His Word. He wants us to eat His bread daily, the Word of God daily, and receive nourishment and sustenance from His Word. You know, it was Smith Wigglesworth who used to say that most people will have three hot meals a day, you know, for their bodies, but then one cold meal on a Sunday for their spirits. And he said, we should, if you want to do anything, turn it around. You know? And, and so we want to feed every day on the Word of God. Amen? Jesus, quoting Deuteronomy to the devil when he was tempted in the wilderness, he said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen? We have to live by every word. We cannot just live off of natural things. For us to truly live, for us to truly walk in the life of God, we need to, to have God's spiritual food, His Word. Amen? We have to eat and feast on the Word of God. Amen? And the Word of God is spiritual food. Amen? Hallelujah. May I ask you a question? Let me ask you a question. What are you eating? What are you feeding your spirit, man? Amen? What are you putting into your heart daily? Right? Whatever you and I put into our lives will be what our life produces. Amen? That's, that's, that's an actual fact. I mean, even the natural people, the motivational speakers and all that who are in the world, they'll tell you the same thing. Amen? What we read, what we look at, you know, what we spend most of our time uh, looking at or pursuing is what is going to shape our thinking and thought life. Amen? And when we shape our thinking and our thought life, this will eventually shape our outward life. Amen? And so it is so important to be aware of what we are feeding on, what we are eating for our spirits. Amen? Proverbs 23.7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And so, whatever you've been feeding on, whatever fills your mind and your thinking, is going to be what you are. You want to know what kind of a person you or I am? Look at your thought life. Look at what comes out of your mouth all the time. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And so, we can... Uh, you know, use those sort of things as a gauge for where we are in our walk with God and for actually who we are. You know, if you want to know who you are, look at your thoughts, look at your words, look what comes out of your mouth. Amen. Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 20. And he says there, My son, attend to my words. Incline your ear to my saying, my sayings. Amen. Not let, not, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy 
heart. And so verse 21 says, let them not depart from your eyes. Reading the Bible is not a one-time thing. Oh, I read Matthew once in 1942. No. You know, you should be reading Matthew as many times as you can get through your Bible. Right? You read it again and again and again. Because it's a living word, you're always going to get something out of it. And you need to, you need to feed on the word of God. So let not uh, the word of God depart from your eyes. And then he says, keep it in the midst of your heart. And how do we keep the word of God in the midst of your heart? You meditate. Meditate. Think on that. Just say, Father, I've just said, I've just read you, let not uh, the word depart from my eyes. Father, thank you, you know, that I can read your word daily. Lord, thank you that uh, you would lead me to read more. How can I keep the word more in front of my eyes, Father? And, and uh, then it goes there, verse 22. For they, the word, is life to those that find them. And then he says, health to all their flesh. God's word is a medicine to your flesh. Verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Uh, some, some translations say, out of it flow the forces of life. And so he says, guard your heart, protect your heart, because out of your heart will flow the forces of life, the issues of life. And what flows out of your heart, obviously, as we said, uh, produces what your outward life is like. And I, I had a phrase here that I wrote down yesterday. It says, the way the heart flows is the way your life will go. Amen. So the way your heart flows is the way your life is going to go. Amen. And we want our lives to flow with the plan of God. We want our lives to flow with the will of God. Amen. And so you set your heart, set your mind that you are going to pursue His word. Amen. And obviously we're talking on the topic of prayer. And if the word is meat and food and bread, prayer is like the living water. It is like life-giving water that just uh, works everything through so that we digest the word. And, you know, all of the natural process, processes you want to have a look at. But we need to be a people who are determined to pursue the word of God, to pursue uh, you know, walking in the plans and the purposes and the kingdom of God. We need to have a hunger for the word. And the best way to get hungry for the word of God is to read it. The more you read the word, the more hungry you get for it. Amen. And so let's look at some scriptural examples of uh, the Bible talking about the scriptures as food. First Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter 2. And it says there in verse 2, as newborn babes desire, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And so we see there that Peter is saying to us to desire the word of God. We have to desire it. We must desire, put that in you to desire God's word. Amen. And then he says, uh, that the word is like milk. And we know that the best thing you can give a baby to grow and to be strong and to be healthy is mother's milk, right? That milk has got all of the nutrition, it's got the protein, the fat, all of that other stuff, the minerals, everything in it to make the baby grow and be strong and have a good immune system and this and that, the other. And the Apostle, Apostle Peter is saying that the milk of the word of God will do the same thing for you and me. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is the Apostle Paul using the same picture. Chapter 3 verse 2. And this is maybe a, a bit of a challenge to the Corinthians, but he says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither are you now able. And he was basically saying, you're still a bunch of babies. And uh, he was challenging them because they were still acting like carnal men. 
They were still acting like mere men. And so he said, you guys are acting like a bunch of babies. I want to give you meat, but you're not able to receive it. And so the provocation to us should be that we, we take the milk, but we, we want to grow. We need to grow up in God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5. Now, I'm personally a believer that Hebrews was written by Paul. Now, that's, that's just my opinion. Uh, I, I, I like to think that it was Paul that wrote Hebrews. But Hebrews chapter 5. And another challenge, and he's challenging the Hebrew believers. And uh, this is another challenge. And I think sometimes it's, it's good when, when these sort of themes are in the scriptures and you see this challenge to the churches. It's a provocation to us as well. Verse 12. And uh, he's challenging them and he says, For the time when you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat. And he's challenging these Hebrew uh, believers. He's saying, hey, by this time you guys should be mature. By this time you guys should be teachers yourselves. And yet we still have to give you milk and not meat. Amen. Verse 13. He says, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. Verse 14. But strong meat belongs to those who, them that are of full age, even those who have by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so the, the apostle here's teaching is challenging the church. Don't stay babies. Grow up. And that should be our challenge. Michael, grow up. Steve, grow up even more. Keith, <laughs> You know, everybody grow up in God. All of us, all of us grow up. There's more to grow into. You will never arrive, right? And if you don't grow, you are going backwards. There is no such thing as level ground in the spirit realm. You are either advancing, you are either growing, or you are going backwards. There's no such thing as I'm on a plateau. You are either advancing and growing in God or you are going backwards. And so we need to be a people who press into God and pursue and grow up. And this is what the, the apostle was challenging. He said, guys, you should be teachers by now. But you're not. He said, you need to be taught the basics again. And so we see there that the, the apostle's desire is that we become skillful in the word of God. And he says that by reason of use, by reason of using the word of every day in our lives, we have the word of God and we, res uh, we, we live. When we face a situation, we go, what does the word say? You know, we mess up. Well, 1 John 1, 9, I've messed up, Father. I did something I shouldn't have done. Father, forgive me. I, I slipped. But Father, I thank you. The word says that you are faithful and just to forgive me. And to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. So God doesn't just ask you to repent. But he also, when you do repent, he cleanses you from whatever wrong you did. Or whatever thing you did. So that you're not left in a state of being unclean. Amen. He cleans you up. But the scripture says that when we put, our, put the word in us. When we study the word. When we become full of the word. And we, we think the word, we speak the word, uh, and stuff like that. It says, by reason of use, we will have our senses trained to discern both good and evil. How many know that Jesus warned us, and many times you look at the Bible teaching us, that it warns us the last days there will be deception. The first thing Jesus, when talking about the last, the end days, when they said, what will, your, what will it be like? at the last of the day, you know, before your return. And the first thing Jesus says is, careful that no one deceives you. That's the first thing that comes out of the Lord's mouth, is be careful that you're not deceived. Amen. I've said to my daughter, uh, Kaylee, I said to her, I said, you know, when you look at the news and you look at this and you look at that, 
uh, until you know it's an absolute fact, consider it a lie. I said, don't believe anything you hear. The only thing that you can trust is the Word of God. Amen. I said, uh, you know, until you know for a fact that it's true, I said, you don't believe it. Don't just receive it at face value, if that makes sense. And, and the point being that this age and the time we live in, there will be deception. And so we don't just receive something at face value. You know, uh, I like to put it this way. I trust the Cobra more than I trust BBC or CNN or ITV or what have you. And, uh, and that's how I choose to live. I, I will look at what the Word says. If the long run proves out right that what they said is true, then I'll go, fair enough. But if something just does not sit right in my heart, I will not receive it. Even if they say it, I won't receive it because something's just a bit hinky. And so we need to understand that the Word of God, when we put the Scriptures in us, when we have the Holy Spirit leading us and directing us, He will give us discernment to say, hold on, something's not right yet. Amen. And so by use, reason of use of the Word of God, we have our senses trained to discern both good and evil. Because deception does not look evil. Deception looks like the real thing. It looks like it's true. It looks like it's the real McCoy. That's why it's a deception. If it was blatant, right, we would say, oh, that's wrong, that's, that's blatant. But deception is not that way. It looks very subtle and sneaky. Amen. Amen. So, stay in the Word. Our life, our strength, our vitality comes from living in the Word of God. Amen. And as the Scripture said in Proverbs, our life force, the forces of life, the issues of life flow out of your heart and produce. Amen? And so guard your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence. Amen? And one of the ways we do that is by reading the Bible. Put in the Word of God in your eyes, in your ears. Meditating on it. You know, chewing it over. And allowing God through prayer, through worshipping Him and, and spending time with Him to allow this to digest in you, to bring revelation, to bring understanding. So it's not just a dry word, right? It's not just a dead letter when you read the Bible, but it's a living word by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 15. We're going to look at the final one. How, how long have we got? Um, I'll have to just check. Because I've still got more to go, but I'm just concerned for time. Uh, we're going to look at healing as the children's bread. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Okay, and verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan uh, came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries, or she crieth out after us. But Jesus answered, and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this is true. This is one of those things that, you know, sometimes we, we miss and go, why was Jesus talking to her like that? But when Jesus came the first time, he came to the Jewish people. He came to Israel. He didn't come to anybody else. It was through the Jewish, Jewish rejection of Jesus that the gospel opened up to the whole world. Amen. Romans 11 teaches us that. But he said, I have come, or I am sent not, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now, what was Jesus calling the children's bread. She was asking, she was crying out for healing and deliverance for her child. 
And Jesus said, that's the children's bread. And so we, you and I, are the children of God. Amen? We can receive our daily bread in healing. Amen? The children's bread. We are children of God. We can receive the children's bread. And she then answered. She agreed with him. She didn't say, no, Lord, you're just defending me. She said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And so, obviously we know that God is a healing God. But I just wanted to bring it in from another angle of the bread. That healing is our bread as well. We can feast on the bread of healing from God. Amen. We are children. We have access through God. Amen. Amen. How long have I been speaking? Am I too long? I don't want to go too far. Uh, should I carry on? Is, is anybody bored? <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, I, and let's look at healing because we've, or not healing, receiving. Let's look at receiving. Because one of the things that when we say give us our daily bread, if God's hand is open, if he is going to give it to us, we need to receive from him what he has given us. Isn't that so? Amen. And, and receiving from God is not passive. It's not a passive thing. You don't just sit there, oh, you know, if God gives it to me, I'll get it. No, you have to receive what God gives. There is a taking. There is a taking in receiving from God. And so we know that when the Lord Jesus went to the cross, right, he paid in full the price for our sins, the Bible says that the weight of every curse was upon him that was meant for us. And then it says he bore all of our sicknesses, all of our diseases. He carried our infirmities. And that by his stripes at the whipping post, we were healed. Amen. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says that Jesus became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so we see that Jesus became sin with our sin. He never committed sin. He lived a perfect sinless life. But the Bible says he became sin with our sin so that we might become righteous with his righteousness, uh, us never having committed any righteousness. Amen. So we are righteous with Jesus' righteousness. And because you and I are righteous with Jesus' righteousness, we have access to the Father, right? We can stand before God, the Bible says, boldly. Hebrews 4 says we can boldly enter into the, by the throne of grace. Amen? And so there's nothing between us and God the Father. Romans 8, 32. Romans 8:32. And it says there, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Right? And we're talking about God giving us our daily bread. Right? And he said, I've given you Jesus. The apostle Paul said, he gave you Jesus. And then he says there, and I, I often add in there, uh, how much more? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He gave you the best in Jesus, right? The best, the best of heaven He is Jesus. He gave you Jesus. Why is he going to shortchange you on healing? Why is he going to shortchange you on your daily provisions and your daily supply? He gave you the best. Why is he then going to give you second-rate blessings? Right? And so we need to see that because we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, we receive the very best of the provision and the supply of heaven as well, our daily bread. God wants to bless us with that thing. And he says there that he will, with Jesus, freely give us all things. And this is good news, right? This is good news. 
Because we don't have to perform to get God to do something. Right? You don't have to kneel on broken glass or whip your back or fast for weeks on end. Say, God, please think and consider maybe if you would think about doing something for me. The hand of God is open. God's hand is open to you and to me. Right? But the problem is sometimes we have a struggle receiving. And I've got a 20-pound note. I'm not giving it to anyone. <laughs> but but if, if I was to give it to somebody and say, Keith, here's 20 for you. What would Keith do? Keith would go, oh, his, his reaction would be gratitude. He would be, oh, thank you. You know? And, and then what, what would Keith do? He would reach out, take the note, and receive it. Right? But now, let me ask a question. If Keith thought I was a bit of a trickster, and he goes, oh, Mike, that note, yeah. That's probably one of those paper towel, you know, those fake 20s, those paper notes, or paper towel notes. Or what if, what if Keith thought that as soon as uh, he reached out to take the note, I would pull my hand away? You know? He, there would be a hesitancy in his receiving from me, right? Or uh, heaven forbid Keith go, oh, Mike, I just don't deserve that 20, you know. Thank you anyway, but I just don't deserve it, uh, which is not the case. Keith, Keith definitely deserves it. <laughs> but in the same way, you and I can sabotage our receiving from God, right? Wrong believing, you know, wrong thinking. We can sabotage how we receive from God. Sometimes it's very subtle. Right? The Bible says that the, the, the devil is, is one of the more subtle creatures. you know. But the other thing of it is, sometimes it's, it's just so blatantly obvious. We know. We know our heart is not in faith. Amen. And I want to give five examples right, of things that we do. And there's loads more. You know, even when it comes to healing, you, know, you could have the mindset, well, does God heal today? You know, does he still heal? Does he still do this? Does he still? And that is something that will stop you receiving from God. But number one, I know God heals or I know God blesses. But does, will he do that for me? You know, I know he does it for uh, Rosemary and I know he does it for everybody else. But I don't know if he'll do it for me. And you feel unworthy. And we've just seen there that Jesus has made you righteous. It's got nothing to do with how good or how bad you are or how bad I am. It's what Jesus did for us that gives us our position in God. Amen. Then there's the other thing of fear. Well, what if I put it all on the line and God still doesn't answer me? What if I put all my faith and effort into believing God and it doesn't work? Where am I going to be then in my walk with God? Because I will have felt I've put everything on the line. And then I'm sort of left hanging. And that's, that is totally the devil. Uh, because I can tell you now, if we uh, are single in our faith, if we're single in our heart, you know, let every man be a liar, but God is true. And I can tell you, if you put everything on the line, God will answer you. God is faithful. Amen. Sometimes, example number three, we have past experiences, Right? Past experiences will dictate how we respond to God's word and how we respond to receiving from him. Well, I had this happen in the past. Or the other thing that will happen, well, so and so, they, they prayed and they believed and it didn't work. You know, so we look at other experiences. We almost elevate that to the level of God's word. Amen. Or uh, a favorite, another one, uh, the doctors say this and the doctors say and the science, the science says that. You know, and we're not against doctors or scientists or, or what have you. But you and I have to make the decision that we'll never elevate a, a doctor's opinion or science to the level of the Word of God in our lives. Amen. It might be scientific fact, but the truth of God's Word changes fact. Amen. And so we need to understand that God's Word is powerful. God's Word works. Amen. And then sometimes even, uh, you know, when we're dealing with sickness and, and things like that, if we have something in our body, you know, we have a pain in our body. Do you know that that pain is speaking to you? It's talking to you. It has a voice. 
And it's telling you, uh, hey, I'm here, you know. And so that voice will challenge the Word of God. It'll challenge the, God's power to heal in our lives. And so you, one of the things that we need to do is pursue a faith in God that is fully convinced, fully persuaded, that does not consider these other things. Amen. And this is why the Bible calls it the fight of faith. And the Bible says it is a good fight. And you say, Mike, why is it a good fight? Well, number one, you've got God on your side. Father God is on your side. The Holy Spirit is on your side. The Word is on your side. Amen. The armor of God is yours. The angels are on your side. And more importantly, Jesus is on your side. And Jesus has already won the battle. He's already won the victory. Amen. Amen. And so we need to become fully persuaded. All of these thoughts, the devil uses them because he knows that if we will hold on to those things, our hearts will be divided. Amen. And the apostle James warns us. He said, when your heart is divided, when you waver, when you're double-minded, that you don't receive. We don't receive from God. And so we need to be a people who become fully persuaded. Romans chapter 4. The last thought, last thought, last thought. Romans chapter 4. We're going to look at Father Abraham. The Bible tells us to look at Father Abraham as an example. And then from verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith. Abraham was not weak in faith and neither are you. As children of God, God has put his faith on the inside of us. You have been given, the Bible says, the measure of faith. And even if your faith is still in its seed form, Jesus said that that faith can move mountains. Amen. So you are not weak in faith either. And it says there, Abraham considered not his own body dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. It says he didn't even consider his body. He didn't consider uh, Sarah's womb, the barrenness of Sarah's womb. But what would have happened, right, if Abraham took out his phone and started Googling, right, can a hundred-year-old dude still perform? You know? Can a hundred-year-old dude still have kids? What if he started Googling uh, and, and YouTube, barrenness, barren woman, you know? What would he have been doing? He would have been considering. He would have been considering his body. He would have been considering the deadness of Sarah's womb. But it says he considered not. Why? Because he believed that what God said was true. And so you and I need to consider that God's word is true. Amen. And it says there, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what He, God, had promised, He was able to perform. And so you and I need to become fully persuaded. And... The easiest way to do this, I like to think, you know, in, med in, in medical terms, when in the medical field they will say, well, anywhere, but in medical they say, oh, that person is heavily medicated, right? And what they're saying is, well, the reason they're in that state is because that medication is working through their body and uh, it's causing them to be influenced by this med medication in their bodies, but also it might be affecting their mind and so on and so forth. And, and that is the influence of the medication. You and I need to see the Word of God the same way, but you and I need to be heavily meditated, right? You and I need to be heavily meditated on the Word of God so that your mind and your body and your thoughts are just full of thinking about the Word of God. You're imagining what God is doing for you. God gave you imagination, right? Imagination doesn't come from the devil. God gave you a mind. He gave you imagination. So that when you pray, 
You know, Mark 11, 24, when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have it, right? So you fill your mind with receiving from God. I imagine I've got that. I receive it. Amen. You are building your, your mind up in the things of God. Amen. You are filling your mind with the scriptures. Jesus, by your stripes, I was healed. You bore my sickness. So in your mind, you say, Father, thank you. I, I see my sickness being transferred just as my sin was transferred over to Jesus and his righteousness was transferred over to me, that all of my sickness and disease, Lord Jesus, was transferred over onto you so that your health and your blessing was transferred onto me. And you start imagining that. You know, you want to pray for people to be healed. Amen. Start imagining yourself. Imagine yourself, Father, I just pray for somebody and they're healed by the power of God. Start putting that in your mind, in your imagination. There are godly imaginations. The Bible says there are vain imaginations, but there are also godly imaginations. Amen. Amen. So, be heavily meditated on the Word of God. Eat, feast on the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you, Father, that it is indeed food. And Father, your Word causes us to be strong. You cause us to be well. You cause us, Father, to walk in the victory and in the purpose and destiny of heaven. And so, Father, even today, I thank you that, Lord, you give us today our daily bread, spiritually, solically, Father, and also for our bodies, in Jesus' name. We thank you for this, Father. We give you glory, and we receive from heaven, heaven's best, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Amen.